Uh, hi, hi everyone. Yeah, it's uh, Roger here. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Extinction Rebellion, and we're very pleased to be on air, as it were, uh, talking to Ian and Adam about very interesting topics. So thank you very much for coming. I'm just going to make a few introductory comments about what we're going to do tonight and where Extinction Rebellion is and progressive and left forces generally, as it were, in the world. And then uh, we'll, we'll get going. And I think at some point, hopefully, we'll run out of steam and um, we'll pass over some questions and uh, see how that gets on. So um, if, I guess most people watching this will be familiar with Extinction Rebellion, but I think it's worth saying initially that Extinction Rebellion has only been going for something like 18 months or two years, depending on how you look upon it. And uh, in that time, we've grown globally, uh, all around the world, and we've mobilised hundreds of thousands of people to engage in various forms of civil disobedience. And we did that, I think, because we were prepared to break some rules. And these were breaking rules, which sort of were challenging for people in progressive and left circles, as well, of course, for the people on, on the right. And I guess that has been successful in so much as Extinction Rebellion was the number one influencer on climate last year. And uh, last year, we engaged in the biggest acts of civil disobedience in British history. So presumably getting something reasonably right. But at the same time, uh, we're all very aware that Extinction Rebellion is, is a controversial project and it's had a lot of difficulties along with other sort of social movements. And one of these biggest difficulties is trying to construct a coalition or a solidarity, as you might say, of people who want to see equality and want to see a sane world. And this uh, sort of excruciating question, let's put it like that, of how people come together of many different backgrounds and cultures and make it work. And I'm the first to admit, I'm not quite sure how to do it, which is why um, we've got on Ian and Adam specifically this evening to talk about um, the class and race um, elements of this, which are obviously central. And I think what I personally am hoping for anyway, is that we can come out of this discussion with a new respect for talking about strategy and i think one of the problems in progressive and left circles is often strategy is mixed up with morality so people think if someone's got a different strategic view to you then they're not just incorrect they're actually morally wrong <laughs> and i find that personally difficult because um i'm the sort of person as some people may know who likes to sort of you know ask difficult questions and do controversial things and I might be wrong, but I'd just like to talk about them. And that connects with a second idea, I think, which is this notion of open debate, of saying, if the left and progressive circles internationally and in the UK are going to get anywhere, we need to be able to talk about difficult subjects. And I guess that means that we're not going to hopefully have a sort of backslapping, sort of, aren't we all right and aren't the bad guys bad sort of discussion? But hopefully we're not going to end up shouting at each other either. We're going to hopefully do something in the middle. It's going to be challenging and hopefully we're going to learn, learn from each other. Um, and I guess the last thing I want to say, which sort of relates to the title of this, is, is arguably soon it's going to be too late. And too late is a bit of a thing on a lots, of, lots of people's minds at the moment as they look at the coronavirus sort of epidemic and this general feeling that nature isn't just standing around you know being sub submissive as it were like it has been for a good two or three thousand years it's basically coming to get us i was talking to a world famous um arctic scientist yesterday who told me in no uncertain terms that the arctic will be melted in the uh in the summer in by 2025 and if you know a little bit about climate change you know that's basically game over for the, the climate. And we know what that means, which is mass starvation, social collapse. And we know what that means, which is the poor and marginalized of the world gonna be hit first in a way that's beyond, beyond horrendous. 
So there's, there's a sort of bite in the tail here. And I think we need to look at how we organize, how we relate and how we build together with a absolute seriousness and urgency, um, given that we have everything at stake, if the truth be known. So I think that's hopefully enough for me to set the scene. Um, as I said to Ian Arden beforehand, I don't actually like doing introductions because they're quite sure what to say. But um, I'll just briefly introduce myself and then I'll pass over to Ian and Adam uh, to, so they can introduce themselves a little bit and then we'll, we'll make a start. So as I said, if you're not aware who I am, I'm one of the people that helped to get uh, Extinction Rebellion on the go. Two years ago, I do research at King's College in London on uh, how to build effective movements and mobilisation of civil disobedience. And I am uh, an organic farmer, I've been for 20 years, which is why I haven't got lots of impressive books behind me, unlike Adam and Ian, because <laughs> I'm in a windy barn in West Wales. So, um, but um, there we go, sorry about that. But uh, yeah, that's basically me. And uh, I do quite a lot of the strategy work for Extinction Rebellion or have done in the past and very much involved in mobilisation processes, not just here, but in the US and Australia and what, what have you. So I'm really interested and honoured basically to have Adam and uh, Ian here, uh, both of whom got a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, uh, done a lot of research on this general area. So I'm going to pass over to uh, Adam next, if you want to say a little bit about yourself, Adam, and then on to Ian. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Roger. Uh, so yeah, my name's Adam Elliott Cooper and I'm a sociologist at the University of Greenwich. Um, I've been involved in a, um, a great deal of organising, uh, mainly in London. Uh, most of the things I organise around are relating to uh, police misuse of power, police violence, police brutality, those types of things. Um, I've also been uh, uh, tangentially involved in a lot of the environmental justice stuff that's been happening um, over the last few years as well. Great. Uh, Ian? Hi, all. I'm Ian Haney Lopez. I'm a law professor at the University of California, Berkeley. And for most of my career, I studied racism within a frame of um, racial hierarchy, whites over non-whites. Over the last decade, I've come to think about racism as operating differently, um, to think about racism as a weapon of the rich against all the rest of us. When I say that, I don't mean to deny that there's conflicts between whites and people of color. I mean instead to direct our attention to what underlies that conflict, or rather, who invests in it heavily, who promotes it heavily, who promotes it continuously, and who profits from it. And I think through that lens, uh, we have a better way of understanding what's, what's happened in the United States in terms of the rise of someone like Donald Trump. Frankly, I think it's a lens that can also um, help us understand the rise of neoliberalism in the UK uh, and Boris Johnson. Um, and I think it's a lens that in turn suggests important lessons about how we organize not only against uh, elites from, from a point of view of fighting racism and fighting neoliberalism, but also in terms of, of understanding why it is that the status quo around the environment has been so difficult to change and what's going to be required to actually shift power away from major pollution uh, generating industries and into the hands of the people who genuinely care about a survivable environment for their children and grandchildren or for themselves in, in, in five years. Yeah, yeah, great. So, um, yeah, so we're going to have uh, a chat between the three of us for about 45 minutes, maybe an hour. We'll see how it gets on. Um, and um, that's not going to be long enough to solve all the problems of the world. I just want to lower a few expectations there. <laughs> but what we do want to do is have a good go at some of these difficult topics in this spirit of uh, open inquiry, as you might say. So I'm going to hand over to Ian. I think we're going to look initially at, at a certain analysis that Ian's just sort of summarised. Um, and then we're going to move on more to sort of strategic and practical questions. So I'm going to pass over to Ian and uh, allow you to sort of set the scene, as it were. So I think what's happening, uh, and I should just say very clearly, um, a students of racism, a students of American politics, I come into this conversation uh, thinking about the sources of racialized mass incarceration. 
um, and how to end it. So I share that with Adam. Not well versed in the environmental movement, although um, the Sunrise Movement here in the United States recently asked me to write a chapter for them for a new anthology they have coming out, making the case for the Green, Green New Deal. And the chapter I contributed explain the connections between the major polluting industries in the United States would be the Koch brothers, for example, the largest privately owned uh, industrial uh, um, petrochemical conglomerate in the United States, um, and their strategy for fending off environmental regulation. What was their number one strategy? Fund groups uh, that organized around racial hatred. Fund the Tea Party in the United States to elect politicians who campaigned on themes of racial resentment, but voted in the interests of the Koch brothers and their network of plutocrats. So I say that by way of explaining, I'm coming into this uh, as a bit of a novice with respect to the environmental movement, but I think that there are larger dynamics around organizing on the left that pertain to the environmental movement. And so, um, you know, with, with a little bit of humility, let me suggest that this is what I see. Uh, and I think that this is particularly applies, for instance, to what just happened with Extinction Rebellion as it sought to develop in the United States and experienced a schism with some people forming a separate Extinction Rebellion group saying the Extinction Rebellion group that initially formed the United States was focused on racial justice and on social justice. Those are distractions. The only thing that matters is saving the environment. We have to act now. Let's focus on saving the environment and not get sidetracked into these pernicious debates about identity or about class. Um, that, that dynamic is real. Let me, let me see if I can explain that dynamic a bit. The left has divided between a set of folks who say, we need to focus on the real issues that confront all of us, and that can be the environment or it can be um, the, an economic oligarchy that now siphons more and more wealth upward. Um, but this left, which I, I, I think of as the class left, but I think this, this, this dynamic also applies to a, a version of the environmental movement. This version of the left says, focus on the issues that unite us because race divides us. And every time we try and talk about race, it fragments our movement. It's a distraction. We don't need to focus on it. And there's also this additional sort of, um, um, you know, hopeful element. Don't worry, if we could solve class problems, that would disproportionately help people of color since they're more likely to be poor or the environmental version. If we save the environment, that's going to help people of color because they're among those who are disproportionately harmed by environmental uh, injustices. Right? But, there's, but there's, this, there's a racial move here, and I want to be very clear. It's a racial move that says race divides us, so let's not talk about it. Let's focus on the issue that we all have in common, ruled by an economic elite or um, the, the dangers of immediate climate collapse. So that's one part of the left. There's another part of the left, which is very powerful in the United States. The United States, of course, different than the UK, 40% people of color. Most of the energy on the left is coming from organizers and activists coming out of communities of color. And they're saying, we really can't be part of a movement that sacrifices what's going on with, within communities of color to communities of color. Racism is what's happening to us. We need a movement that addresses racism uh, front and center, and if the consequences of talking about race, uh, talking about racial justice, talking about white privilege, if the consequences of doing that is that some whites feel uncomfortable, so be it. We're willing to lose those folks because we will not have our issues pushed aside uh, anymore. And, and you can call this the racial justice left. Notice that uh, what you're developing now is a deep division within the left. One part that says our strategy going forward should be to focus on what unites us and avoid what divides us. Race divides us. We're not going to talk about it. Another part of the left saying, first and foremost, we need to name and confront racism. And we understand that these two positions are polar and alienate each other. We're ending up with a fragmented left. And you can, you can see it, it just happened to Extinction Rebellion. Uh, in the United States, this shatters the left. And it, it should be clear, 
this shatters the power of the left to actually win fundamental change in society, whether that's saving the environment or a shifting economic wealth downward and outward or ameliorating state violence against communities of color. We end up with a shattered left. That's the problem we're confronting. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause there because what comes next for me is a larger analysis of what has happened to us that helps explain that schism, um, and then a set of suggestions about how, how we move forward. But before I just go tumbling on, let me, let me see if Adam wants to come back in, questions, comments, or Roger. Um, but at this stage, all I'm trying to say is, here's the problem we're confronting. We've got different visions of how to save society in which the different sides understand that they're alienating each other, but don't see a way forward and don't um, um, and are unwilling to relinquish their own sets of priorities. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, thanks so much, Ian. I, and I really agree with um, a lot of what you were saying. I, I think I, maybe I'll start by picking up on something that uh, Roger said at the start, which I thought was really um, quite British, um, which was that the question of racism is, um, I think you described it as excruciating, Roger. And I thought that was a really interesting um, uh, adjective to use because, of course, here in Britain, we don't really do race, right? We do, we do class here in Britain. Race is this thing that happens in America. It used to happen in South Africa, but they sorted it out in the mid-90s, I think. But here, I think in Britain, we feel a lot more comfortable talking about class. Race is this is something that um, yeah, makes, I think, the British generally feel uh, very uncomfortable. And I think Brit British people feel far more comfortable about talking about racism as something which happens over there on the other side of the Atlantic. That's that terrible, crude American thing that happens over there. And I think one of the reasons for that is because, um, Brit you know, Britain likes to tell itself, you know, we have been doing race, but it kind of happened when all those darker people came here after World War II. That, and that's when race began, started happening for the British and everybody happened before then. And I think that's because there's this kind of amnesia, of course, that um, Britain has been doing race for a very, very long time, but it hasn't been doing race on the British mainland. It's been doing race in its colonies. Um, it's been doing race, um, of course, in its former colony of the United States, but of course, across the Caribbean, being the largest slave trading nation in human history, across the African continent, the Indian subcontinent, uh, much of Australasia. All of these places are places that Britain has been doing race for a few hundred years now. And so race very much is a, 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 an important part of uh, British governance, uh, British culture, British politics. And I think that's a really important thing for us to remember. And so when we think about race um, as um, I think something in that you said that was really interesting, um, which um, a lot of the left uh, kind of uh, say was the effect of, you know, race is this thing that divides us. Um, and that's why, you know, it can get in the way of um, being uh, what Roger says is being strategic, right? Being practical, getting things done. Um, but I think race is really important to identify the fact that race does some, does, doesn't simply divide us. It does more than that. Right? It doesn't simply divide us into a hierarchy. Um, which, of course, um, many of us have probably generally agree with. It also does something else really important. It's what's used to govern, right? Race, race is what's used to govern. It's what's used to categorise different human beings, right? And once you categorise, once in order to categorise different human beings, you need to put them into different kind of kinds of, I guess, boxes or modes. Right? So if we think about different categories, such as um, uh, immigrants or citizens, um, criminal or law-abiding. Um, peaceful protester or terrorist. We can see the ways in which these different categories, the terrorist, the criminal, the immigrant, are informed by racial thinking, right? Race really informs how we uh, identify or imagine the category of terrorist or immigrant, right? And of course, race therefore also um, informs the way in which we imagine the peaceful protest, the citizen, right? the law abiding. Right? Um, and one of them is white and, and one of them is not. And so I think it's really important that we understand that as being what race and racism is about. It isn't about identity, isn't it simply about how people choose to identify. Um, and so therefore racism isn't about simply uh, being mean or horrible to, or not liking people or, um, who are racialized differently to them, but it's a system of governing different categories of people. And anti-racism, um, therefore, just to finish up, isn't simply about challenging those hierarchies, but it's also about challenging that system of governance and, their, and by extension, those categories in and themselves. Uh, but maybe let's move towards um, uh, what Ian wanted to, to work No, no, towards, I, I think, yeah, I think that's, that's great. Um, let me, let me um, 
let me pick up on some of that because I think it really goes to, if we're honest about um, this division in the left between those people who say race divides us, let's not talk about it. And those people who say we need to focus on racial justice. That's a division that corresponds with racial categories. Right. And so I'm going to start, I'm going to start using the phrase class left and race left as shorthand. I think a lot of environmentalists are within the class left. I think that there are some folks in the environmental movement most closely asso associated with environmental justice who are part of what I call the race left. But let me use these as shorthands. And again, it's a bit of a caricature, but the class left says focus on what unites us. Don't talk about what divides us. Race divides us. Very often, these are white folks, though there are some people of color who take this position, but this is predominantly a position advanced by, by whites in the, on the left. The racial justice folks say racism is not just something that divides us. Race is something that fundamentally structures the lives of communities of color. We cannot tolerate having that issue pushed to the back burner. We must address it directly, even if it alienates some whites. Those racial justice activists, a few of them are white, the bulk of them are people of color. And now let's, let's stop and think about that sociologically rather than you, there's something innate about community identity or race or biology. This is sociology. What's happening? Most whites are uncomfortable talking about race because they feel that a, a robust conception of racism implicates them, implicates their position in society. So one of the things that Adam said is, a lot of whites um, hold on onto an idea that racism is being mean to somebody and maybe using a racial epithet. And that's a very convenient way to define racism if you want to define it so narrowly that you don't need to feel that you might be implicated in it yourself. Whereas a lot of people, uh, sort of racial justice folks are saying, racism is, yeah, it's treating people badly. Yes, it's violence. Yes, it's genocide. Yes, it's racial epithets. But in addition, it's culture. It's colonialism, it's the history of the UK, um, it's the way in which power is and, and wealth and jobs and union membership are all distributed. That's a conversation that's very discomforting for a lot of whites who then, if they're really to engage in a serious conversation about racism, have to say to themselves, did racism help position my family? Does racism partly benefiting from racism, explain where I am, what I take for granted, the assumptions I've made, the cultural stereotypes I draw on. Those are very, very uncomfortable conversations. So the class left, the class left does not exist outside of race. They are within a highly racialized context and they're making a couple of moves. The surface move is to say, we too believe in racial justice, we just think it's divisive, so let's focus on this, this goal that's really gonna help us. But the subtextual move is, we're really not that comfortable talking about racism ourselves, and we don't like the way in which it constantly implicates whites, right? And now, that's the division, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm highlighting that not to indict whites, um, uh, nor to sort of uh, celebrate racial justice folks as being truth tellers, the larger point is all of us as human beings um, want to feel good about ourselves, want to feel like we're good people, want to protect our status, and we get very uncomfortable and very defensive when somebody draws into question our morality, our bona fides, our family, our position, what we've achieved, right? So that's all of us. That's just, that's just human beings. But from there, I want to say, that's precisely the conflict that we need to find a way out of. The left is at an impasse. If a, a, a huge part of the left on a sort of unexamined basis thinks that being white is something they need to defend so that they don't really want to engage in race. And yet another part of the left is actively saying we have to fight racism because it's structuring our society, because it's a form of governance in our society. How do you, that's the chasm, that's the conflict. How do you bridge that? Because if you can't bridge it, you will end up with a divided left. And again, just to repeat, what it means to have a divided left is the left doesn't have sufficient political power to do anything 
but stage protests. That is, it lacks sufficient political pro power to take over and actually change the direction of government, whether that is ending economic oligarchy or saving the environment or ending systematic state violence against people of color. The left so far has locked itself into a position in which we're pretty good arguing with each other, but we haven't figured out how to, how to get past that impasse so that we can actually build political power together to do the things that all, the, all the different things that we want to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, just picking up on that, um... I think there's. I think for the for the for the UK context, we obviously we have very very similar problems in, in the United States, and maybe there's maybe two examples I can think of um, that we can help to connect people in, interested in uh, what we're calling the race left to the environmental movement, and then uh, people people who are working in the environmental movement or uh, the class left, how we might um, help them to think more about uh, the importance of understanding racial justice and how that's connected to the environmental movement. Um, so I'll, I'll start with um, how, how we might speak to people interested in racial justice, um, interested in, um, in racial justice. Um, so I think, as we mentioned before, race is used to categorize people and places, right? Um, and it's used to put them in a hierarchy um, and to say that these are the people who are immoral or degenerate or, um, or are worthy or, or of exploitation and, and, and so on and so forth. But of course, one of the main uh, drivers of uh, climate change and environmental degradation is the extraction and exploitation of resources across the global south, right? across Africa, across the Middle East, um, across parts of uh, Latin America and elsewhere. And the re one of the main reasons that it's seen as it's considered acceptable to treat these parts of the world in this way, right? To dig up um, the Niger Delta in, in, in West Africa, to, to, uh, to bomb and occupy uh, parts of the Middle East, right? In order to uh, uh, fund military coups across uh, Latin America and, and to try to control the resources of that reason, to continue taking oil out of the ground and, and, and funding uh, our, this, uh, our, our bloated and overdeveloped economy economic system in the industrialized north. The, the reasons, well, the main reason this is all seen as acceptable is because of race and racism. Right? We, the, the reason that we're able to accept the bombing of these countries, the controlling of these countries, the environmental degradation of these countries is because of race and racism. And, and so therefore, if we want to be able to effectively argue against the exploitation of the natural environment in these parts of the world, we have to understand why it is that these parts of the world are not considered worthy of the same uh, protections as our homes here um, in Europe or North America. Right? We have to understand that there's a difference there, right? There's a reason the Niger Delta is being treated in a way that rivers could never be treated here in Britain um, or other parts of Europe, right? There's a reason that the bombing of the Middle East could never happen here in Western Europe or, or Canada or the United States, right? And race is actually fundamental to that. So we have to understand that if we want to stop, if we want to keep that carbon in the ground, we have have to be battling racism as well because the people who are extracting carbon from that ground need racism in order to justify the, the violence and the, the, uh, the environmental degradation um, that they're carrying out. I think the second thing that's really important um, is thinking about the way in which racism is fundamental to not only exploiting and controlling uh, people of colour across the world but it's also an, a way of reproducing the exploitative and authoritarian power of the state more generally. Um, maybe a good example would be um, the prison system or the welfare system, um, uh, we call the welfare state um, here in Britain, right? So, um, of course, many people um, from, from the UK uh, listening will know that uh, we've had massive cuts to um, the welfare state um, through um, this, this kind of austerity programme. And one of the most powerful ways in which we've seen um, uh, the welfare state, um, uh, I guess, um, uh, disregarded as something which needs to be cut down, needs to be reformed, is being exploited. Um, and who are the people who are exploiting it? And more often than not, very, very often, it's these immigrants that seem to be exploiting the welfare system. It's, it's um, we're being told that asylum seekers and refugees and these people who don't belong in the nation, don't deserve to be um, having a piece of this welfare state pie, don't, um, haven't contributed what we 
the national people have contributed and therefore shouldn't have a part of it. And it's this, there, and it's this constant kind of chipping away at the legitimacy of the welfare state by using racism in this kind of way, which has helped to legitimise the austerity programmes, which has destroyed the welfare state, council housing, youth provision, uh, um, uh, ca social care, all of these types of things for everyone. Right, so we see the ways in which racism is used to justify the, um, the erosion of the hard-won benefits um, of uh, the welfare state in a way that not only oppresses people of colour, of course, but of, even if they are um, often the, the primary targets, but in fact um, dispossesses the masses of people as well. So, so let, me, let me pick up there um, and, and, and to offer some context, I agree with everything you've said, Adam. What's so important about what you're saying is it's an analytic move that provides a foundation for getting past the, the loggerheads in which the left finds itself uh, um, uh, right now. So we started this conversation by saying the left is badly divided with some people, um, uh, mainly whites, saying we can't talk about race and other folks um, mainly activists of color saying we must talk about race. And we said, well, how do we get past that? How do we get past that? And now this move is to say, hold that conflict for a second. Let's step back and actually understand what's happening in our society. Um, and what's happening in our society is, um, put bluntly, capitalism is harnessing the power of racism and it's doing so internationally and it's doing so domestically. To understand uh, internationally, you know, to repeat, um, Adam, you gave a great description. What you're seeing is resource extraction across the global south that is shrouded behind, um, that is protected by a cloud of indifference. And that indifference is fundamentally racial in nature. We don't really care about or know about or identify with the peoples of, of the uh, Niger Delta, for instance, right, behind a, a cloud of racist indifference. Let me signal what's super important about making that point. This is not a claim that we should care about what's happening in the Niger Delta simply as a matter of morality, though we should, human beings are human beings, but it's not just morality, it's saying, and again, this is something you said, Adam, if you wanna keep the carbon in the ground, if you want to save your own family, it is a matter of pragmatic necessity that you care about the people of the Niger Delta, right? And so th this is the move to say, capitalism has harnessed racism to its advantage. If you want to protect yourself from the ra ravages of capitalism, you will fight racism. And part of that story can be told internationally. Um, Adam, you also said, well, let's think about the prison system and the, and the, and the welfare system or the welfare state. Here again, and I, and I think this is, this is a crucial point for the United States, but also for the UK. What we've seen is a robust public commitment to the idea that government ought to work for working families, systematically attacked and destroyed through racist narratives that say to folks, you can't trust government because government cares more about helping undeserving people of color than taking care of hardworking whites. That's the rhetoric that the Republican Party has mastered and has been using in the United States since Richard Nixon was elected in 1968, then Ronald Reagan, George Bush, uh, Donald Trump, over and over again, his rhetoric is, sorry, you can't have health care because health care is really a giveaway to undeserving people of color as well as illegal immigrants. This is, this is what has happened. Um, and I, I actually want to pause for just a second. You think about the phrase like welfare state. Now, I don't know how that phrase registers in the UK, but in the United States, the right has been so successful at tarnishing that phrase that you lose support from liberals when you talk about a welfare state, right? Like, like the word welfare no longer means the health and well-being of people. It now connotes for most chiseling and cheating and an entitlement mentality and dependency. We progressives in the United States can't even use the phrase welfare state because the right has been so successful 
at painting it in racial colors that say welfare is the government taking money from hardworking whites and giving it to undeserving, larcenous, cheating, lazy people of color. Um, for, for my own part, I've begun to switch to the language of activist government and to say, we need activist government. What does activist government do, do? It regulates capitalism. It taxes great wealth. It redistributes wealth downward. It creates routes of upward mobility. It funds education. It funds healthcare. It funds infrastructure, right? All the things that we used to associate with the welfare state, people can't imagine that anymore. This is a moment to say we need activist government. And to sort of, you know, just to, to, to put this point on it, how will, how does the right fight the idea of activist government that might, for instance, act to avert climate collapse? They don't do so by saying climate collapse is no big deal. They do so primarily by saying activist government is about giveaways to dark and undeserving people. We cannot build popular support for activist government until we name racial division as a billionaire's trick and affirmatively build cross-racial solidarity. And so to bring this back to Extinction Rebellion in the United States, those members of Extinction Rebellion who, who um, uh, left and said, we need an Extinction Rebellion that focuses exclusively on the environment, you have committed yourself to failing because the number one weapon being used against you is racial division. And if you think you can build popular support for saving the planet by not talking about the number one weapon being used against you, you're a pretty lousy strategist. Uh, great, I've got nothing to add to that one, definitely. Um, Roger, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add. You've been quite quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm sitting here, like, you know, being classically uncomfortably British. So, um, is this excruciating? <laughs> which, um, which um, you know, uh, you can take that any way you like. But, um, I mean, I'm curious, rightly or wrongly, to hear about what this concretely means. And maybe that's because I'm avoiding the issue, but my self-understanding is I see myself primarily as someone who tries to knock heads together to get things to happen. And I spent most of my life, you know, I started to activism when I was 15. And most of my life, I've been trying to get people to see bigger pictures and, you know, join together on the basic premise that collective action is what creates real change. So um, this is why I'm curious about what Ian's got to say in terms of how this translates into actuality. I mean, rightly or wrongly, I find one of the frustrating things about this sort of debate is you know, when people say, talk about race, I'm not, you know, maybe this is my problem, but my, I'm not actually sure, to be honest, what that means in terms of actual stuff, if you see what I mean. I mean, I've got some ideas, but I'm not sure whether they're the right ideas in terms of what does it actually mean on a Thursday night? What am I doing? You know, or what, what does someone do? What's the, the tactical and practical stuff here um you know which isn't to say that what you've been saying is wrong obviously you need to have you know a broad a broad analysis and i you know i agree with everything that's been said in that broad sense um but what i'm interested in you know as someone who's building a social movement is okay so um what's the action points as you say <laughs> and I, I think ian you one of the things i'm interested in is i think you've come up with what I see as a really interesting framing and I, I, I've got this image in my head of sort of standing up in front of a bunch of you know white working class guys in Wales and going dum, 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 dum. and they're going oh yeah that's that sounds reasonable if you see what I mean and that's what that's what I'm looking uh, at and I'm not saying that's the whole story of course but but yeah so I'm going to pass to you uh, to see yeah, where are we up to on that one? Yeah, yeah. And what you're describing is the sort of challenge that I immediately ran into. So um, law professor, um, really close student of race and racism for many years, wrote books that were historically oriented. Um, 
One of the books that I wrote was called Dog Whistle Politics that covered 50 years of history of the Republicans figuring out precisely how to use race to break um, social solidarity, to break people's commitment to the idea that government ought to work for people and not for corporations. So I did all of that research. And then, of course, immediately, the question is, well, how do you make it practical? How do you, how do you actually move people? Um, at the time, um, uh, Richard Trumko is the president, still is, president of the AFL-CIO, the largest uh, federation of unions in the United States, 12 million plus members. Um, he, read, he read the book and he said, you know, come and talk to the union members. Um, that, was, that was incredible. Um, I had that experience of talking to a room full of white working class union leaders. Let me be clear, unions in the United States are more racially progressive, even ones that are overwhelmingly white are more racially progressive than most Americans because unions do have a sense of the way in which race is used to break working class solidarity. So these guys were already pretty well along and yet when I started my conversation with them and I said, hey, is there a problem with racism in their unions? You know, frankly, the, the, the response I got back was a sort of a cynical laughter that said, yeah, there's racism, but it's not a problem, right? Like there's, you know, there's some deep skepticism. Again, this is sort of a class left thing. Is this gonna be one more lecture about white privilege? I'm already tuned out, right? Um, what I ended up doing was saying, let's focus on racism as a weapon against the union itself. Let's admit that many union members, the majority of your membership right now is voting for politicians who promise to destroy your union. And then, right, and I said, you know your membership are voting for people like the governor of Wisconsin, Scott Walker, or, um, former governor of Wisconsin or, or Donald Trump, they're destroying the union. You know that your members, why are your members voting for them? They're voting for them out of racial appeals. It's because these politicians are saying, stand with the hardworking American, code white, against the threatening black person and the undeserving illegal, right? That, that's the rhetoric. And it was a conversation that said to them, do you see a future for your own children in your union and to a person, they didn't. And I said, don't you realize the reason there's no future in your union is because too many of your union members are organizing their political lives around defending white identity. White identity, the political defense of white identity is killing your union. And if you wanna have a union for your own children, you will fight racism within the union and in our politics. And that conversation actually it was galvanizing in the sense that at least within, you know, within that day, people really pivoted. These white union guys who started by saying, I'm not down for let yet another lecture, ended the day by saying, we need to figure out how to integrate our unions because it's racism within our unions and in the political system more generally that's taking away the good jobs that I would like to leave for my own children, right? So huge transformational change. Now, Having had that experience, I also understood, you know, um, you needed to scale up. You needed to do something that really resonated with people immediately, that could be pervasive, that could be easy to use. Um, so I pulled together, I founded this project in the United States called the Race Class Narrative Project. And I brought in as partners a communications specialist, not Shankar Osorio, and also another racial justice um, uh, think tank leader, Heather McGee. The three of us as partners stood up this national research project, a couple of years, um, focus groups, polling. And what we showed is that a political message that emphasizes the, the connections between race and class and the need to come together to take care of each other is the single most powerful political message in the United States today. It is more powerful than the, mess, than the right's message of racial fear. It is more powerful than the race left's message that we need to protect communities of color. And it is more powerful than the class left's message that we need to fight for economic populism, but ignore race. And so let me just give you a, a sense of what that message is. A, a, a race class message around the environment, 
for instance, might say something like this. We all want a world in which our children have a healthy environment and can thrive, right? So, so you know, first, shared values. Start with shared values. Second, but today, certain politicians and crooked corporations care more about profits than people, and they are busy running their industries in a way that's destroying the environment for all of us. So that second move, identify a new enemy, the clear enemy. Third move. Then those greedy, the, those politicians and those crooked corporations turn around and seek to divide and distract us, telling us we should blame black and brown people and immigrants for the scarcity we all confront. All right, so that's the third, right? Like their tactic is divide and conquer. And the fourth and crucial move is not just to indict uh, the, the, the oligarchs, but to call for cross-racial solidarity. So we end the message with something like, when we come together and build cross-racial alliances, we can have the power to make sure that government works for us and protects the planet, not for corporations and major polluters. Right? And so again, you start with shared values, you identify the real enemy, you name divide and conquer as their tactic, you name unite and build as our response. And notice in all of this, this is not colorblind. This is not an evasion of race. It's a direct engagement with racism. But it directly engages racism in a different way than the race left typically does. It doesn't engage racism first and foremost by, by calling it a white problem. It engages racism as a billionaire strategy. It says we must confront the racism that the billionaires are using, that the polluters are using against all of us. And again, this so we tested this message, um, and I want to say, it's, it's hard to communicate. Let me just say, this message was shockingly successful from a public polling point of view. Um, we tested nine different versions of it, some focused on um, um, economic populism, other on working families. All nine versions beat the right's message of racial fear. They, they were, all of nine beat the racial justice messages. They're stronger than the colorblind economic populism approach. This, the race class narrative project is such an important proof point for the idea that right now, today, 2020, naming racism as a divide and conquer weapon and affirmatively calling for cross racial solidarity to make sure that we have government that works for people of all racial groups, whites included, is the single most powerful political message available, at least in the United States. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, uh, uh, um, I'm trying to think about the ways in which um, uh, that could be, I, I think there's a lot of ways in which that could be transposed to the British context, but I guess I'm kind of stuck on Roger's um, example of um, uh, uh, young people or some working people in, in, in Wales um, where he lives and, and what he might want to say to them and, and how we could think about that. And I'm struggling to go beyond, I guess, reiterating what I was, what I was kind of, I guess, thinking about before, which was the fact that clim if climate justice um, wants to as I guess we, as we both said, um, keep pumping the ground and stop environmental degradation. It has to be an anti-imperialist movement. It has to be a movement against powerful nations exploiting um, poorer ones. And that anti-imperialism is fundamentally anti-racism. And so if we think about the already existing anti-war movements and anti-imperial um, campaigns that exist in this country, which want to stop invasions and exploitation and um, occupations and all of those types of things, then I think we can begin to have a, a um, perhaps a conversation that's um, uh, perhaps more fluid between uh, anti-racism and environmentalism. But I think also importantly in the UK that conversation's happening in some ways already um, because the other I think really important link between uh, climate justice and, and anti-racism is the question of immigration and borders. More and more people are, are being compelled or forced uh, to flee their homes uh, to, um, uh, to Europe or um, other parts of um, uh, the global north in order to flee the effects of climate change, whether it's affecting uh, crop yields or um, uh, living conditions or, or, or anything else like that. 
And so having solidarity with the people who are fleeing those environmental changes, I think is also fundamental to our, um, our any kind of climate justice campaign. And I was really heartened when uh, the school strikes took place, which was, um, for those who aren't familiar, uh, uh, young um, school age students who went on strike demanding uh, action on climate change. And one of their big um, uh, slogans was, um, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on YouTube, I guess you are. One of their big slogans was fuck the home office. Um, and I thought it was really interesting and, and powerful how for, the, for these young people, it was almost common sense for the, them to link uh, their climate justice campaigns to their demands for um, justice for migrants and, and, their, and their campaigns against uh, border regimes. And for them, that was completely normal. And making a sign like that and taking it to the climate um, strike meant perfect sense to them and I think those kinds of organic links and that kind of very more organic kind of thinking among multicultural groups of young people I think is something that us and maybe as, as the more parts of the grown-up left could really learn from um, and I think having those kinds of um, that, that kind of sociality, those kinds of social relations among people from different backgrounds and, and, and maybe have different experiences, or perhaps maybe also help us to better understand the ways in which um, the struggles against borders or police brutality or militarism or imperialism and, and saving the planet against climate uh, catastrophe are, are very much linked. And we have to make sure those struggles are, are combined if, if any of us want to um, uh, see substantive change. So super helpful i think what i would say is you know i, wa I want to make clear when i invoke the race class narrative project i don't mean that it's the be all and end all i mean it's it's a proof point and what does it prove it proves the power of these sorts of new messages but one of the great insights i think of organizing and roger i'm sure i'm sure you know this from your point of view is um you start with where people are at you ask them what the problems are that they confront, and then you offer an analysis that helps them rethink the nature of the problem, um, who the enemies are and who their allies are. And, and so I really want to emphasize in, in, in some way, Adam, that connects up with what you're saying. Things are organic in the sense that people are trying to figure out and respond to the immediate crises in their lives. Um, but that doesn't mean that they automatically understand how they relate to each other. So if you have a movement that says we are concerned with climate, uh, the, the imminent climate collapse, and also we see that a lot of people in our generation face deportation, they might not fully understand the linkage, but it provides such an important starting point because it, it, it creates an opportunity for a group like Extinction Rebellion to help with an analysis that says, the reason we're confronting these simultaneously is not mere coincidence. The reason we're confronting these simultaneously is because a rhetoric of dangerous immigrants and a state practice of deportation has been used by the ruling elite to distract us from the way in which government primarily serves the interests of industry, including large scale polluters, right? You, you, you need that move to analysis. Um, let, me, let me take this a step further though, because um, there's, a, there's a version of a race class that approach that's, that's uh, immediate and can be put into practice today, but there's a version of it that has much deeper implications, organizing implications. And let me, let me start by, by framing it this way. What would it mean if you had an environmental movement or a labor movement that truly and deeply internalized the idea that the number one weapon against them was racism against black and brown people, and that the number one thing that they had to do to move forward to save the environment or to build an effective labor movement was to fight racism against black and brown people, right? Because what, what, what I see on the left is a lot of organizations that are white led, that are white dominant, that think about racial justice as something else that they should be doing, but it's relatively marginal, it's relatively peripheral, and you, you, you get lip service to it, but I don't see organizations on the left, I don't see many organizations on the left that aren't already racial justice organizations that are organized in a way that suggests those groups have deeply internalized the idea that racial division is the number one weapon of the billionaires against all of us. It's the number one weapon to preserve the status quo that's killing us. 
right? And so from an organizing point of view, this isn't just how do we share an analysis? This is, wow, we on the left need to model what this new society we're trying to build looks like. We need to model a truly integrated uh, environment in which power is shared, a status is shared, um, um, the, 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 the leadership, the membership is, is, is fully integrated and fully committed to pushing back against racial division, to tamping down on racism, to building a sense of linked fate across race lines and across, frankly, lines between immigrant and, and, and citizen. Yeah, great. So I was going to try and summarize that <laughs> and then potentially move on to some questions. But um, um, I mean, how, what I think I'm hearing is this idea, and obviously this is my interpretation, is, is some sort of move towards people realizing that they're being played, you know, across across different divisions that have been used historically to divide people and this feeling of being played is manifests itself you know in the US particularly around racism and a variant of it in the UK is around immigration and that being played is a way of dividing and ruling so that the elites or the billionaire class or whatever you want to call them can maintain the death project of the status quo, which is what it objectively is now. Um, and I think this is massively exciting analysis as I see it, because although it's still very sort of difficult to get beyond the suspicions and the defensiveness and the judgments that occupies, you know, the different splits on the left, there's there's an awareness, I think, that, that we have to start moving beyond that. And to be honest, I don't have exactly the ideas of how that's done, though I think you've pointed in some good directions in terms of the framing, and the framing seems to be really powerful. Uh, but I think, I think it's something to do with, we're not, we're not against, we're not helping we're not helping people of color out here. It's not a charity thing. It's a self-interest thing. It's not a guilt thing. It's a solidarity thing. Is that, it, it, to me, that seems to be the kernel of it. And that's why it's working. Because no one likes to be guilt tripped, particularly, you know, if you're a hardworking Welsh farmer or something, you don't, as you say, you're not going to take kindly, you know, rightly or wrongly to someone coming and saying, you know, you're a bad person. But you are going to, but you do have an enormously powerful awareness that the whole system's fucked. You know, you know, it, people's incomes in this part of Wales are going down. Globalization has destroyed the farming industry. You know, but because the right wing press and because of this billionaire framing dominating public discourse, these groups don't even talk to each other. <laughs> and you know, I've one of these fancies is getting a bunch of Welsh farmers to go down to London and talk to a bunch of people in Brixton. I think it'd be really quite interesting. So you know, maybe this is this is something that you know needs to happen in the future. And what you laid out is is the beginning of a of a way of talking about this that brings people together rather than splits people apart. Well, I mean, right. I, I you know, is there something you want to add on that that I haven't quite got? No, I think I think you've got it exactly. Um, uh, you know, earlier we had talked about about solidarity, and and we used the phrase survival solidarity, right? The, 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 this is solidarity um, as an ideal, to be sure, as an aspiration, to be sure, but this is solidarity as a pragmatic requirement if any of us are to survive. And, and I, I want to emphasize that because I think that what you're saying, Roger, is so important. Building trust between farmers in Wales and people in Brixton, that's not going to be easy. That's not going to be one conversation. 
um, people are going to be offended. People, people are going to be mad. People are going to be distrustful. Why shouldn't they be? They're drawing on, you know, a, an absolutely pervasive cultural common sense of deep difference, of conflict, of superiority and inferiority. It's enormously hard work to build cross-racial solidarity. Why should people do that work? And I think that in the past, what we've said is people should do the work of building cross-racial solidarity because it's the right thing to do. It's the moral thing to do. Racism is, is, is a grave wrong. And that convinces a small handful of people to do that hard work. Um, and what that has produced on the race left is a deep skepticism of whites. Right? On the race left, among racial justice activists, there is a very pronounced skepticism that says, White people aren't going to do this. They're not going to give up their privilege. They're not going to talk honestly about how they wield power in society. The, the, I've heard white people talk my whole life about cross-racial movements, and they never give up any power. Why is this time going to be different? And so there, there has to be shifts both on the class left or the environmental left, the, 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 the race silent left, let's say, and the race forward left. The race silent left needs to realize that their analysis is fundamentally wrong and that they will fail unless they deeply engage the question of racial division and fully commit to building cross-racial solidarity. And the race forward left needs to say, this is going to be hard. We're going to have to create openings. We're going to have to create space. We're going to have to um, lead with the idea that we're all in this together rather than lead with a critique of white privilege. Then when we get people to the idea that we're all in this together, we'll have to do the hard work of actually getting past white privilege so that we can have a, a left movement that is actually multiracial and racially egalitarian, not in name, but in reality. There's a tremendous amount of hard work. The only way we're gonna do this hard work, make these, make these changes, suffer through these conversations, experience the doubt, experience the conflict, the only way we're gonna do this is if everybody on the left understands our survival is at stake. The survival not of, uh, well, the survival of humanity in, in, in general, yes, but of our own families, of our own, of our own children, our survival is, is at stake. And the most immediate threat to your family may be climate change. The most immediate threat may be the lack of housing. The most immediate threat may be police violence. All of these threats are interlinked, and none of our families can survive these threats unless we do the hard work of building a genuinely egalitarian, cross-racial, progressive movement. Right? And, 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 that, and not out of charity, not out of guilt, um, but out of a sense that this is survival solidarity. Okay, yeah. Well, this is powerful stuff, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's equally obvious and equally sort of challenging at the same time, I think. You know, you're like, <laughs> you're sort of, part of me is going, yeah, 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 that's, you know, <laughs> it's a no-brainer. And then part of me is going, oh my God, you know, like, this is an enormous challenge. But I think one, you know, one of my f feelings around it, having been in Extinction Rebellion, is there's some sort of desire to get this fixed, you know, by a lot of people on both sides. and. And, you know, I have, I'm not pretending I've got exactly the, the plan here, but I think what you're saying is leading us forwards um, to some sort of, you know, not, it's not going to get fixed in, you know, one conversation this way. But I think there is a push here, which is the objective extremity of what's going to happen to us if we don't get our shit organised, you know. And that's, it's been really helpful, at least for me, to, to, to start to understand some details really on, on what this might look like. So I've just got a message here saying we need to go to questions. <laughs> so apologies to people that have been waiting to ask them, but um, you know, it's good to have a, a, a bit, quite a lot of detail and I think we've done that. Um, I've got a, a question here saying, um, and this is a sort of different sort of take or a, a, a complementary take, I suppose. It says, 
diversity is enriching and beautiful and not a reason to compete. So could this consciousness be a way to change? Is, is, is there a positive thing here, I guess, as much as we're all going to hell if we don't cooperate, you know? Right, it's right. So, <laughs> so we are, we all of us, uh, or at least in the United States, but I suspect in the UK too, we all of us are trying to figure out how we're going to survive. And the right is telling us the way you survive is by building walls and buying guns. You need to exclude other people. You need to protect yourself. You need to circle the wagons. Um, now, most people don't want to live in a world of conflict and fear. They don't want a world of conflict and fear for their children. Most people. But if you tell them the threats are so grave, the danger is so imminent, you must circle the wagons and buy guns to survive, they will do that. The left has yet to say, to, to really articulate a message that says to people, the opposite is true. The only way you're going to survive is by Opening, the, opening up your sense of connection, by extending your hand, by ha developing a sense of linked fate. Most people want a world of human connection, of curiosity, a world of joy and sharing, but they have to believe that that's a world in which they and their families can survive. And so this is where I wanna connect up, the, you know, the, the, the questioner asked about diversity. Adam talked about the new generation. We're in a moment in which there's more and more of a, of, of a culturally shared sense that a world in which we get to eat different foods and, and learn about different religions and, and, and learn about different customs, that'd be a pretty awesome world. Um, it's the world that more of our young folks occupy and grow up in. But we need a story that goes beyond that and says, and embracing that world is what's going to help you survive. Right? And, there's that, and there's, there's that negative that comes in, the survival imperative of, of climate collapse, also the, the immediate crises of the coronavirus. People are like, how do we get through this? Right? If we can give people a plausible story that says building connections, building a sense of linked fate across lines of division is the way you survive, I think most people will embrace that because it honors the, the, the values and the aspirations most of us already have, live in connection with each other in a way that's full of joy and curiosity, so long as I'm safe and protected doing so. Like that, I, I, I think that's the, yeah. those twin pushes. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's really Sorry important. Um, but I think, I think it's also important for us to whilst of course embracing diversity and wanting to dismantle uh, the socially constructed uh, divisions between us is really important. I think it's really important for us to also remember that these divisions were not constructed benevolently, right? They were constructed into a, in a hierarchical fashion, right? Um, with um, uh, some people categorised in certain ways higher up in the hierarchy than others. And beyond that, and more importantly, I think, it was also used to categorize people, as I said earlier, categorize people um, to make them associated with um, being the immigrants or the criminal or um, the uh, um, or the terrorist, right? Someone who's, so, so the, ra these racial divisions not only put people into hierarchy, but they also dehumanize some specific groups of people as well. And if we want to embrace diversity in all of its beauty, we also have to actively reject the dehumanizing divisions Visions which categorize different human beings in different kinds of ways. And that's really, really important, not only simply on a human and moral level, but also, as you mentioned earlier, on a strategic level, right? Because it's, this through, it's through this strategy of understanding how different human beings are divided and some people are dehumanized, which helps us to understand why it's acceptable to treat Africa and the Middle East and other parts of the world and their environments in the way that they are, right? The destruction, it's the destruction of these environments that are destroying the ecosystem. And if we understand that it's um, uh, this, 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 
the human the dehumanizing nature of these racial divisions that makes environmental degradation and climate catastrophe possible then we can then we that we can enjoy the embracement of this diversity whilst doing this quite serious work of both anti-racism and environmental justice as well here here okay so so yeah we've got a good question here i think is um so who is this mystical mythical even <laughs> right wing you are expecting to win over uh, never seen never seen them coming to my local group or our actions i'm glad for it um and i think this raises if i could just add a little bit to this question is there seems to be um a lack of clarity on what who 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 who's in this coalition you know and a lot of people might have conservative views but they're not necessarily right wing and this is one of the things i think gets a little bit confusing right is a lot of yeah there's there's a diversity in amongst what you might call ordinary people or ordinary white people um so where where where's where does where do you where do we go with that so I would make a distinction um, between folks who are, who are daily and deeply engaged in politics and, and the vast majority of the rest of the population, which isn't. And I would start by saying, first and foremost, we need a, a, um, this sort of race, class, synergy, and coalition building among the folks deeply and daily engaged in politics. The left itself cannot build power when the left is at war with itself. So, you know, people should not hear me talking about um, a model of racism as a weapon against all of us as a way to win over this mythical right wing, da 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 da. This is a way to build unity on the left, first and foremost. We don't build that unity we can't reach out and build a larger coalition. It is, it, is a, it is a prerequisite to an empowered left that we build unity across the left around a, around a racial analysis that says it's a class weapon being wielded by industrialists, by the oligarchs against all of us and all of our issues, though they may seem separate, the environment um, uh, or, or underfunded schools or police violence against communities of color. They may, be sep they may seem separate, but they're in fact interrelated. So that, that's the first audience. The second audience is this great mass of people who aren't really paying attention. Now there's a set of people who are paying a lot of attention and are, and are hardcore right-wingers. They don't like people of color. They're, they're pro-wealth. They distrust government. We're never gonna reach them. No problem. Go do your own thing. There's a great mass of people who can be understood as conflicted. They're not paying a lot of attention. They have conflicting value systems. Uh, on the one part, they're fearful of immigrants, distrustful of, of government, um, tend to think that the marketplace rewards hard work. On the other hand, they also believe the opposite. They, they, they think racism is wrong. They understand that people of color uh, uh, face barriers that they don't. They think government should provide help, should fund, for example, the health services. They think a lot of people get ahead because of uh, the families they were born to rather than their personal character. They're toggling between conflicting worldviews. The left needs to first, again, build its own coherent uh, uh, coalition, its own coherent unity around um, this vision of racism and division as a weapon against all of us and then needs to share that message, push that message with this conflicted population. I'm not suggesting that this sort of an approach can build, you know, win over 80 or 90% of a population. That's just impossible. But our research indicates you can get well above, you can get into the high 50s and maybe to 60%. And at least in the United States, getting to 60% of voters is an absolute revolution in terms of governing power. Whereas getting to 50% plus one is the same gridlock and worsening division uh, and a status quo that we can't change, right? And so, th so, so th this is a, such a great question. Audiences, first and foremost, the choir. The choir on the left 
They are, we are not singing the same song. We've got to coordinate the choir. Yes, preach to the choir. Yes. Then from there, the folks in what we might call the conflicted middle, conflicted because they're toggling between different sorts of ideas. And whichever idea seems the more promising route for their family, that's the one that they'll vote in terms of. And right now, the right is talking to a lot of those conflicted voters saying, all of your ideas that are rooted in fear and resentment, that's what's going to protect you. And the left needs to say to them, your, your, your aspirations for, for, for coming together, for, for not being racist, for making sure government provides certain basic necessities, for recognizing that, that hard work should be protected and rewarded, that's what's actually going to save you. Right. I'm, um, do you want to say a few words on that? I think we've got time for one more question. So, um, which I think, I think would be good for both of you to, to answer, if that's okay. Um, so we'll do that and then we'll just have a little summing up as it were. Um, so it says, so what does the British part of XR consider the weapon used against us and how would we challenge it for environmental activism and again i i think what we might be getting at here is so what's the plan <laughs> you know um i mean maybe i maybe if i can add my little slant on it is what's what do you both see as a you know as a finishing question here what do you see as a, a, a practical concrete program for UKXR uh, and uh, internationally for that matter uh, on, on what should be done you know are we looking at bringing those Welsh farmers down to Brixton you know is that is that a plan does you know where let's have a few concrete ideas um, if that's okay um, I think I think if the XR is really interested um, and committed to building links of solidarity, they need to look at the big social movements that exist in the in Britain already, where people are are confronting issues in their immediate reality, whether it's having to picket or fight uh, the Home Office or uh, deportation centres, whether it be unions who are fighting for uh, better paying conditions for workers during the coronavirus outbreak or uh, for healthcare workers, all of these different kinds of um, social movements uh, that, are, that exist in this country at the moment so that people can relate to on a day-to-day -day basis because it affects them in their everyday reality. I think it's about turning up and helping out and, and having conversations about how these kinds of um, important movements for health, um, for um, uh, a safe and, and uh, reasonable working environments, for an end to the border regime, the violent border regime, how all of these things are intimately connected with climate justice as well, right? In the ways that we've talked about for the last hour or so. And it's only through those kinds of conversations um, by going up and turning up to, to these pickets outside, um, when people are on strike or to when people go and uh, process outside uh, deportation centers, all of these types of things are fundamentally important to galvanizing the conversations that we need to have to realize that these struggles are intimately connected. And it's not about trying to incorporate one into the other. The two are already incorporated into each other. It's about understanding the ways in which they're incorporated so that we can uh, better, gal better um, uh, build and, and hold together those kinds of coalitions. But, but if, if I can just say, like, does that mean... I mean, I'm sort of envisaging here that there's a, from what Ian's saying, is there needs to be a conversation. We need to, I'm interested to know what having a conversation concretely means, because sometimes it can be just some abstract, you know, intellectual sort of notion. Or sometimes does it actually mean, you know, there's 10 guys in the room with 10 other guys and they're, and they're basically trying to grapple towards the frame that Ian's saying. And I'm sort of thinking, that that's what we're saying here is that there is this conversation and then there's some action and then maybe there's another conversation like there's an interaction between the two over a period of four months i mean does that is that what you're saying adam it, you know <laughs> is it something along those lines yeah potentially i mean okay i think the example of the climate strike is a really good one right they had a strike about climate but it was also about borders 
And that conversation was written on the side of a placard, but it was also a conversation that I'm sure was happening in those streets, right? And it was, I think it was happening a lot more organically than what could potentially feel like a social experiment if you helicopter in some Welsh farmers into Brixton, right? And I think, and I think by, by you know, it, it's not gonna, and, and as Ian said, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna, you know, they're gonna be long conversations and, and, but I think really importantly, they need to happen kind of organically, right? I think when people could turn up at the climate strike, the, those school strikers, and there were people there were like, right, this is climate strike, what? Well, I'm interested in, in um, ending this border regime as well. So we're gonna make these kind of placards and we're gonna have this conversation in action. Um, it felt, I, I'm sure it felt like a quite an organic kind of experience, right? An organic conversation. And it, and, it, and it melded together really, really well. And I think XR could probably learn a lot from these um, school children who are having those kinds of conversations together in their classrooms, on the streets, and bring that action not only um, among each other, but also to the public and to the government as well. Okay, Sin. So, so what do you think about this, about this organic sort of way that, it happens as it were. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure about that. <laughs> yeah, Not that I've got, I, I haven't got any problem with organic sort of connection, but it feels to me like the, the divisions that exist are not going, need to be proactively dealt with. Um, it, it, at least for adults. I, I totally get it in terms of teenagers on the street because there is that organic connection as, as Adam said. And, but I mean, Ian, what, what 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 do you think about that in terms of the, the concrete, the plan here? So, so <laughs> to put you on the spot, sorry. Yeah, no, no. As a <laughs> as, as a professor, my, you know, my 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 uh, my vocation requires that I invoke the power of education. <laughs> but in all seriousness, you know, I don't know what the climate strike youth look like, but I do know that in the United States the younger generation is much more multiracial, but just about equally susceptible to racist stereotypes, precisely because we do not have a culture, um, an educational system that talks forthrightly about how race works and that provides people the analytic tools to make sense of the work that racism is doing, the bullshit that they've grown up with, um, what explains the evident disparities that are everywhere in our society. Okay, all of that is to say a race class approach is both immediate and also must be a medium term purposeful strategy. Immediate in the sense that, hey, you can get your comms team and you can start putting out messaging about race class solidarity immediately and it'll work and it'll have traction precisely because at a sort of an organic level, people deeply understand um, that our system is being run by the rich for their benefit, that we are being divided, and that until we overcome division, we really can't get control of our society back from the corporations and the oligarchs. People get that immediately, right? That's, we, we've already showed that. So you can put a messaging plan into practice on that right now. But I think, Roger, what you're sensing is to really make this work, to really seize this as a, 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 a pivotal moment for our society and for, and, for, and for our globe, this needs to be proactive. And we need what, you know, what, what organizers used to call consciousness raising. People need the opportunity to think through systematically and rigorously, what does it mean? to exist in a society that has been organized around capitalism uh, uh, that, that defends itself through racism. That, there, it, it, that is not, there's nothing simple about that. And the implications of it are dramatic and also dramatically different. If you're interested in the environmental movement, there's one set of implications. If you're interested in uh, uh, immigration, another. If you're interested in ending mass incarceration, another. This is going to take a tremendous amount of work. So I would say for something like XR, XR needs to shift the communication strategy, but then also internally, immediately push towards internal consciousness raising, um, conversations and study groups. This is a paradigm change. I, I doubt there's what, one, two people in XR right now who if you said to them, what's the number one environmental threat we face would answer racism. And yet 
that is the number one environmental uh, threat we face it's racism because that is the weapon of the polluters right so so that consciousness raising needs to happen and then once xr begins to do that internally it needs to start doing that externally xr needs to invest heavily not simply in actions but in leveraging those actions into a changed mindset and that mindset it, it will start with the activists but eventually it has to be a mindset that is promoted culture wide so um artists musicians um uh actors um, um politicians all writers all of the people engaged in the production of culture need to be brought into this new mindset in which division has been weaponized against us and all of our fates are linked right and this needs to be a surround sound message that is delivered everywhere um so this is a sort of a here's what you can do today here's what you can do next month here's what you can do over the next year and here's the goal for the next 5 to 10 years what we are really talking about is connecting up this the, the power of these ideas as a way to build power among people because it's it, we are we are confronted by the vast bulk of power and wealth in our society being wielded by and for the benefit of the few and the result of that is economic misery the result of that is extraction industries that are ruining our climate the result of that is a uh, state violence against people of color is is the is is a tremendous fear and conflict being actively promoted by the right the only way you fight the power of the few is by building power among the many and and so these are the set of ideas that will facilitate the hard work the, the consciousness raising the organizing um the 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 purposeful solidarity building that will allow uh, the left to actually build power among enough people to get to get our democracy to, to make our democracies democracies Right. Well, I was going to ask you about to sum up, but I think I think that's a good summing up. And I'm I'm looking at the clock here, so I think we need to finish at one and a half hours. <laughs> um, and I think, being a practical-minded guy, I think maybe the thing for the audience here, you know, is okay. So what does what does this mean? I think you've laid out both of you in your answers there a sort of some practicalities and they obviously need working on and they need people to animate them you know they need people to come forward and there's a message there which is really clear which is i think the new message which is attractive as you've both said to both sides of this debate it's not what about one side capitulating as it were it's about moving into a new way of seeing things that people are sort of aware of but also it's about something concrete happening both organically and proactively in terms of bringing people together into the room or out into the street and and that needs people to do it right <laughs> so if you're listening to this and you you know want to engage with what ian's saying in terms of the practicality of building these mass movements not just xr but the mass movements that we need over the next five to ten years to deal with this you know, enormously dire situation of, of, of our survival, then it's all hands on deck, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm not pretending I or anyone else is going to get it dead right. But, you know, one of the good things I think about XR is, is we're open to this sort of, you know, new ways of doing things. And I don't think we've got it right by a long shot, by definition. But uh, hopefully this conversation is going to, lead some practical practical engagement that's a really exciting a really exciting thing so i'd really like to thank you both so much for coming on this <laughs> it's a little bit nerve-wracking isn't it <laughs> i find it anyway you know try to be co concise within one and a half hours but hopefully everyone's sort of got the general gist and and you know i'd like to thank everyone that's listened to it as well if you're still here and um and the best of luck everyone so we'll leave it there and thanks so much.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Roger. Bye. Thank you.